<laughs> hey everyone, my name is Katie Lorenz. I'm the founder of Campo Alpaca. I am here today with Logan Kasha of Kasha Films and Maya, who is one of our fantastic Campo team interns for the summer. So I realized there's so many Badgers that are doing really cool stuff and we would love to talk to them, learn about how they got to where they are, and of course, capture tips for folks that might be interested in their career path. Hey, this is Logan Kasha here. Uh, I am a director and DP of my company, Kasha Films. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Katie at Campo several years ago when we were filming um, the video for the Kickstarter, actually. I remember we were riding horses or the donkeys? Horses, <laughs> the donkeys? Yeah. horses. We were riding horses, uh, capturing the alpaca and their natural habitats. We went up to the Rainbow Mountain. And I just had a gimbal and like a wireless lavalier uh, to record Katie's um, introduction. With that, I'll pass it over to you, Maya. That's just as an opening question, how did your communication arts degree in Madison prepare you for the entertainment industry and filmmaking in general? I went to Wisconsin, uh, class of 2012. Um, I was a communication arts major. I entered with a background in film from my high school, uh, mostly in unscripted documentaries, and then I took all the prereqs, ultimately with my desire, trying to get into the um, production class 467, which was focused on more narrative filmmaking, which on 16 millimeter film, which was super cool. Uh, don't really use that practically these days uh, currently, but that was a pretty cool experience and uh, had a good time learning how to actually cut film like people used to do. I see that your production company typically produces documentary over narrative feature films. What's one aspect of documentaries or documentary filmmaking that speaks to you? And like, how do you feel it better illustrates stories over narrative filmmaking? A lot of people ask me, are you ever going to go into narrative? And I don't know, I, I could, like I, there's elements that I appreciate, like and you can pick your location and like pick your lighting situation. And that's exciting. But what's more exciting to me is finding, <laughs> sounds so cliche, but finding like the beauty in the situation you're given or, or like, Here's someone's story, you're capturing it authentically. I'm trying to find the greatest shot, the most beautiful shot with the lens flares, with the beautiful lighting that exists naturally. Who's like your most intriguing subject that you've worked with like thus far, if you can pick one? I might go back to the very first one. I went to Glenbrook South High School in Glenview, Illinois, and we had a documentary assignment that was um, shoot a five minute documentary about something local like and a lot of kids were picking after school activities the marching band like uh, i might have even done like our school mascot or something like that and i picked to be our subject about tommy carroll who was a, a blind um at the time he was a very serious skateboarder and he still skateboards he's a he's a blind boy uh, who's been blind since he was two um and he has no recollection of seeing at all he also water skis and uh, plays drums and does all these like insane things better than most sighted people can do. Looking back, I'm kind of like impressed as a high school student. I, I sought, you know, him as a subject out over anything else that was the easier reach. And uh, I, I think it was his motivation and the success of that documentary. Um, I ended up playing film festivals for a high school student. I actually I suppose I have an aptitude for storytelling, or at least wanting to tell um, positive, inspiring stories. Who's your biggest inspiration as a filmmaker? And as an undergraduate student in Madison, <laughs> what gave you the courage to like start your own production company? I never was like really <laughs> idolizing many people. I, I kind of found my own path, which is cool. Um, if anything, it's like a person I worked with. Like when I was at Wisconsin, I was fortunate to get hooked up with a guy named Bill Roach, who still lives in Madison. And he was the father of a friend of mine. I was given the opportunity to film Russell Wilson at the Capitol when he was a, a player and a student at Wisconsin for ESPN. I was used to shooting like home movies and, you know, music videos like handheld. And like now I'm like, you know, in the professional realm. And I, I, all I remember doing was I, I never saw, let them see me walk. I was running to carry a sandbag. I was running to carry everything. And because I did that, because I didn't impress them with my camera skills yet because I had none. Uh, they, they, they said, hey, can we hire you to shoot this next feature in Michigan? Like, you're going to fly, you're going to meet me at Madison Airport. We're going to fly out and shoot for the weekend. Uh, I can call you out of class. I can write you a doctor's note. And I was like, okay, if I'm at this school to like do this professionally, like, why don't I just like start now? Like, I, so that was a tremendous opportunity. He was like a mentor to me. He still is. We still shoot together today. Um, so I suppose that it would be my inspiration and uh, help along the way. 
filmmaking obviously requires like a certain level of adaptability. Do you think of like a specific time when you had to like adapt to like a pretty challenging, like, I don't know, change? Sure. Like, how did you handle that? Yeah. One that comes to mind is when I was on campus shooting one of the Packer music videos. Um, Cause like I kind of got my start um, shooting music video parodies. They actually were um, with the teach me how to Bucky video. And then we followed up with a couple of Packer videos. There's a time when we just kind of like happened upon a great space um, that we didn't have permission to shoot at. It was it was just kind of like an abandoned like warehouse and we were filming in front of it. And I, I have no idea how, but like we were shut down and like police showed up. I, I don't know how. And we were just filming like a passion project. Like and they're giving us 10 minutes to finish what we had scheduled an entire day, full day shoot. I was shooting and directing. So I just kind of had to just get it all done uh, and, and adapt. And that happens every time you have storyboards, you have plans and you can have the best pre-production in the world, but everything can change the moment you get on set. Something changes, schedules changes, stuff out of your control and you just have to adapt. You can't get upset. You just have to put your head down and get through it. How do you find experience in all aspects of filmmaking? I guess like post-production process, like filming, I don't know, before hmm. that, like more of the planning process uh, assists you as like a director of photography. When I was in high school, I kind of thought editing was like my forte. And that's kind of what I thought I'd be doing. I, every time like I was like up and coming, I'd always say, oh yeah, I'm gonna like edit like, you know, I don't know, films or music videos or whatever. Uh, however, once I found my niche in cinematography and directing, uh, the editing definitely helps because there's something called shooting like an editor and you know what you need to make the scene work. If if you're directing and DPing or say it's a collaboration where like you're holding the camera, but you also have to think, okay, what shots do they need to get? If, if someone's not, if it's not a commercial and it's not like their specific shot list, you got to think, okay, how is this scene going to work? And what can I shoot to give the, the editor, actually the editor and the producer, stuff they need to tell the story, stuff they need to tell the scene. So that certainly helps knowing, okay, if I cut to this, it's going to be a jump cut there. But like for continuity, you got to think about the 180 degree line and, you know, there, all that comes into play having edited. Tell me about like the first time you felt like you kind of had like made it. Honestly, I don't think it's like a specific project or acknowledgement. Like, you know, I, I have received Emmy awards, which is like the pinnacle and like the broadcast TV. And that's, that's great. It's a great recognition, but it wasn't even that I, I like to be, <laughs> I consider myself humble. I try to be humble. Uh, and that doesn't allow you to ever, you know, think highly of yourself. So it is, I, I think I'm hard on myself a lot of the time. And I think recently I realized I need to be more kind to myself and it kind of took a toll on my mental health by always not being happy with, uh, my work, I guess that's what it is. The ability to walk away, the ability to say no, uh, when you get to a certain level, you don't have to take every job. You don't have to take the jobs that aren't respecting your day rate or whatever. So, so the ability to say no, and that's, that has a lot of weight and I've been working on doing that more often. What stories did you want to tell as like a driven person in your early twenties versus now? Like, has that evolved or changed or anything? I think the message has been the same. It was always kind of like, you know, the underserved or people who don't have a voice or a platform, like we have the unique opportunity as filmmakers to give them a voice, like to tell people stories that have inspiring stories or just wouldn't have had otherwise been able to for any number of reasons. Filmmaking is obviously a highly collaborative art form medium. I guess just what does the creative process look like for you and your production team? So for like unscripted, uh, generally a producer will come to you with a story idea and say, uh, you know, we have this like two week shoot in, I'll use the most recent one I did in Qatar um, about, it's about the world cup. And like, we have these interviews, but like a lot of it's like subject to when you get on the ground, we talk about the week, we talk about the shooting schedule. We talk about what equipment we need. Um, then we start creating like a, a budget or an estimate, start figuring out what crew would be best to fill these positions. Um, you know, so typically we'll need a director of photography, uh, which doubles as the camera operator, and then perhaps additional camera operators, uh, a sound mixer, um, if you're lucky, maybe a PA or an assistant camera. Uh, also, if you're lucky, a gaffer, but sometimes you have to be as small as possible and nimble as possible. And in this situation we, we did, cause we didn't know what to expect. Yeah, and once you get on the ground, you just gotta be able to adapt, like we said earlier. And what does like location scouting look for you? Like for your production company and like, how does that work? If you're working for a client, 
and it's not your own project, you're kind of at the uh, discretion and mercy of what they've built in, what they've built in for their time, what they've built in for the budget. Is there time to scout? Sometimes there's not time to scout. Like in Qatar, like there's not. Like you're you're there for a finite amount of time and you got to go or depending on if you're on location somewhere else. Um, and you just got to show up. Sometimes you're given like a white room, which we were. We ended up pivoting and saying, hey, actually, do you have any other options? They said, this is the best room. It's the biggest room. Like, yeah, but it, to us, it's not. And they gave us like an office that was smaller, but it had more like things. It had more things that could be colors and textures out of focus that I'm like, wow, it's a thousand times better. If you have the ability to location scout or if it's your own project, like I just got back from New York on an independent project that I'm shooting and producing where I have a vested interest. We have a look that I'm like creating, like, let's figure this out. We were able to scout. We found this like amazing location in New York. It happened to be a tiki bar and it just served the story like a thousand percent. If you can do that, you definitely should. But there's a lot of time, especially in unscripted, where you just, there's no, there's not time. There's not time or budget and you just got to make the best of it. But given the opportunity, take a look at the location, take some pictures, directors, viewfinders that you can attach your actual lens to. I like literally taking my camera handheld and bringing a lens because the iPhone doesn't exactly translate to like the field of view of a real lens. Pictures help if you're passing them on to like say your gaffer, hey, this is the space you have to work with. Here's the constraints, here's the ceiling heights. But for me, I'm extremely visual. I want to like see what that depth is. I want to see like what can be out of focus and stuff like that. How do you think publishing tools like TikTok, advancements in iPhones and other accessible filming equipment has equipped the new generation of filmmakers? And how do you think this differs from when you were in college? I remember, like I said, I shot 16 millimeter film for my class. But then the next year after I graduated, kids were shooting on Canon 5Ds. They're shooting digital SLRs. Um, so like even that quickly changed technology is always changing like for me i'm always buying new gear i'm always buying new cameras like you just everything changes and you have to adapt to stay with it if you want to give like one piece of advice to um aspiring filmmakers uh what would you tell them one time when i was at uh granger there was uh i believe it was lev spiro who is a director uh, for a lot of stuff, particularly I met, I met him on the set of Modern Family when I was out in LA, but he, he spoke at Wisconsin and he said throughout life, there's like this, you'll find there's like this invisible hand that guides you and stuff happens without you having to worry all that much about it. Yes, I think you need to learn and understand and devoting time to mastering your craft, but you don't need to worry. Everything seems to sort itself out, um, provided that you have the dedication and drive.